Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Friday webinar. Welcome to CCTV. I'm Executive Director Derek Auger. And today we have a very special presentation here. And I know a lot of you, there's been a lot of interest in this. Thanks for registering those that have joined us live. I'm just going to do a little introduction first here, talk about a few things, and then we'll get our presentation underway. I'm just seeing everyone filing in here. I just want to make sure everyone's got time to log in and get excited about what we're about to experience. Uh, in terms of upcoming Friday webinars, next Friday, November 4th, we have Eleanor Gummer and Cecile de Rosier joining us again, and they're going to talk about uh, music by women composers, and they're going to feature some French composers next Friday. And those are always very interesting and informative repertoire sessions. For those that haven't seen them, you can see any of the replays on the CCTV web, uh, the CCTV YouTube channel. And then the Friday after that, that's November 11th, we're going to have Elaine back, who's with us today, and she's going to talk about ornamentation. And I'm sure her performance here today in lecture is going to stimulate your interest in wanting to see what she has to say about ornamentation through the 1617 into the 1800s. And then on November 18th, our first visit from Dr. Gilles Como of the Piano Lab at University of Ottawa is going to talk to us about why piano pedagogy research is so important and what we can learn from it. And I know it's a number of you have already started registering for that. For those that have um, been looking at our new teacher and student portals through our website, uh, if you have any issues with that, please reach out to us by email. Let us know and we can get you hooked up with our tech team so that your teacher portal can be activated. We realize a lot of you are in there and people are registering, so we see it working really well. And some of you are still having issues with that. Please reach out to us and let us know so that we can resurrect that for you. I'll just make an announcement about in-person exams. That's something we're working more toward now. And that is our February session registration is now open through the new student portals. So students can register for February exams. And in select centers where we have enough numbers of candidates, we will consider offering an in-person examiner in some of those places. If you're a teacher that has a number of students that would like an in-person examiner for February, please reach out to me by email so we can start that discussion. Um, most we're finding that most students are now preferring the online option. And so it is a little harder to maintain the old in-person option, but we'd like to work with you though, to, to make those happen wherever possible. So feel free to reach out to us, get your students registered. We've extended the deadline to, to December 2nd now for the February session, just to give you a little bit more time to get into those new portals and get, teach, or get their students organized. And that'll still leave us enough time for February exams to organize some of those in-person as we can. And so I just want to, I'll give a brief introduction here, Dr. Elaine Keeler. She's a CC examiner, has been affiliated with us for quite a number of years, and she's Professor Emeritus at, or, or from Carleton University, where she spent a career there as a pedagogue. She's a, a performer, a very seasoned performer, as we're going to learn and listen to today, and she's done a lot of research into all sorts of different things uh, with piano pedagogy, has authored many different articles. And I think we're going to get to know her a little bit more throughout the year here and in the coming years through the webinar. She's agreed to come on and share some of her insight and knowledge with us. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to learn from her knowledge and, and equally admire her performance skill here today. She's in her home, I believe, Elaine, where you have this Clemente Forte piano that you're going to enlighten us on today. So I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm going to share my screen, everyone, and have, we have some notes here that Elaine's going to speak from so that uh, you can follow along visually as well. So Elaine, I'll turn this over to you. Go ahead and, and give us your lecture and we look forward to what you're having to say. If anyone has any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat box or the Q&A and we'll answer those a little bit later in the program today. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And hello to everyone. Uh, now I'm sure that almost all of you, if not all of you, have at some point <laughs> come across Muzio Clementi, uh, particularly probably through the Opus 36 uh, sonatinas. Uh, but I don't know how much you know about the rest of his career, which was quite interesting. And uh, so I thought that I would begin today by just doing a brief overview of his career. And uh, as you can suspect from his name, he was born in Italy and more specifically Rome and showed his musical talent at a very early age. Um, and by when he was in his early teens, he was heard in a performance in Rome 
by Sir Peter Beckford. And uh, Beckford was so impressed with Clementi that he uh, made a, an agreement with Muzio's father. And the agreement was to the effect that Beckford wanted to take Muzio back to England to his estate, and he would pay for his musical education up until the age of 21. And the only obligations on Muzio's uh, part was that he had to provide musical entertainment at the estate when required. So Clementi ended up in England and uh, Sir Beckford provided him with a Broadwood piano. Now, probably Clementi had had some experience with the pianoforte because of course we know that uh, Cristofori had invented the pianoforte around 1700. However, uh, Cristofori made very, very few pianofortes. And basically in Italy, there were very few instruments. The uh, idea about making this type of instrument had really moved to Germany because a German keyboard makers had of course been making clavichords and the action of the uh, pianoforte is closer to that of a clavichord than it is to the harpsichord. So I suspect that Clementi's early keyboard experience uh, in addition to playing the organ was mainly on a harpsichord. So having a Broadwood piano at this uh, Beckford's estate would have given him the opportunity to find out what he could do with the pianoforte as it existed at that time, um, in contrast to what he had experienced with the harpsichord. Uh, once he what, had fulfilled his obligations to Sir Beckford, he headed for London, England, and there he quickly made a reputation as being a very, very fine harpsichordist and pianist. And he also conducted um, at the King's Theatre. Now, of course, at that time, uh, conducting was usually done from a keyboard instrument. They're not necessarily playing all the time, but seated at a keyboard instrument and filling in perhaps bass patterns if needed. Um, he was very uh, well uh, received and uh, got more engagements. And he also started teaching. And I just uh, listed a few of his students. I'm sure many of those names are familiar to you. Um, but for instance, the first name, uh, Teresa Jansen Bartolozzi, um, was a very, very good friend of Haydn. And Haydn wrote a number of his sonatas, particularly for her. Um, he's then embarked on a tour of Europe. And that was to promote the Broadwood piano. And on that tour, he performed in many, many different places, <clears throat> including uh, at the uh, French court. But the most um, familiar aspect of that particular tour was the competition that was set up between Clementi and Mozart on December the 24th, 1781. And this was at the court in Vienna. And uh, so the emperor listened to them both uh, and declared it a tie. Um, however, there were some there that felt that uh, Clementi uh, was more brilliant than Mozart. Um, but the, I think the interesting thing is, is we tend to hear, I think, much more about Mozart's verdict on Clementi. And, uh, in a way, what Mozart said about Clementi was a bit, uh, I think, also uh, racialized because he criticized him as an Italian. Um, but uh, he did say that Clementi was able to do uh, wonderful double thirds passages. Um, and um, I want to just play a little bit of the opening of the Clementi Sonata that Clementi apparently played at this competition and see whether you recognize anything of it. Of course, this. Is the theme of the fast section of the Magic Flute Overture that Mozart wrote in 1791. 
And in fact, when Clementi uh, had further editions of this particular sonata uh, published, he would put a, a specific little passage in saying, this was written 10 years before uh, Mozart took the tune for his overture. Uh, but Clementi spoke very kindly about Mozart's playing. And he uh, specifically said, I have quoted here from his um, student, Ludwig Berger. Um, and this was what Berger said that Clementi talked about uh, Mozart's playing. Until then, I had never heard anyone play with such spirit and grace. I was particularly overwhelmed by an adagio and by several of his extempore variations for which the emperor had chosen the theme and which we were to devise ultimately. Uh, apparently, uh, Mozart played his uh, uh, twinkle twinkle variations as one of his things. They were both, uh, they had to sight read sonatas by Paradis. And then they had this improvisation to do on the theme that the emperor gave them. So what was it that uh, uh, set Clementi apart, shall we say, from uh, other performers of the day? Well, he was doing things on this instrument that had not really been uh, done before, such as uh, doing runs in parallel thirds, six, and octaves, uh, very expansive arpeggio passages, um, and he would like to use the upper level of the um, instrument as well as the lower. Um, and this had not been really pursued to a great degree by um, other uh, performers at the time, except perhaps to a certain extent by Scarlatti. And so after that very successful tour, Clementi came back to England and he basically stayed in England with just occasional jumpets to um, Europe uh, later on. I have another quote uh, from his uh, a former student, Moscheles, uh, about Clementi's piano playing. And uh, Moscheles says, his playing was marked by a beautiful legato, a supple touch in lively passages, and a most unfailing technique. Meanwhile, in London, of course, his compositions were being published, both sonatas and some symphonies, uh, mainly by the firm Longman. And uh, Longman's firm was at 26 Cheapside in London. But in the early 1790s, they, the company started to have great financial troubles. And Clementi stepped in and uh, became the main partner in the company. And that of course changed his status in England itself, because in England, a businessman was much more admired and was considered part of the upper society than a pianist. A pianist was put in the same category as a circus performer. Um, and uh, apparently the other thing that Clementi was hoping to do when he was in Europe was to probably meet a woman of the nobility that would be willing to marry him, but that didn't happen. So by becoming a businessman, uh, Clementi was really able to move up the social scale in England. So he took over this company and the company operated from this number 26 cheap side which was the most uh, prestigious street in London, England at the time. Then uh, we have um, a very important event in his life as a teacher, as a pedagogue. And that is the appearance in 1801 of his art of playing on the pianoforte. And you can actually download this whole treatise from, from the internet now. And it's very, very interesting. And when I do my um, uh, a presentation on ornamentation, I will be referring to it as well at that time in two weeks time. But what we have in there, it, uh, we have 22 pages of preliminaries of musical notation. And then <clears throat> we have 10 pages devoted to fingering. And fingering was very, very important for Clementi. In fact, if you can find uh, duplicates of his early editions, 
of his works. The fingerprint is very precisely given as to what he wants used in passages. Um, he was very much a proponent of the five finger position, um, make it lie well under the hand. And in his art of playing on the pianoforte, he actually puts down the fingering that we still use today for every major and minor key uh, scale. And um, I also find that his fingering for the chromatic scale is the most efficient and fluent of any fingering. And I don't know why today we still see uh, technical books coming out with some of these, uh, which I feel like are very awkward fingerings for chromatic scales. So after that um, preliminary first, he gives a very interesting collection of what he calls 50 preludes and lessons. So he writes a little prelude to each piece, and then we have a particular selection. And so I've just listed the composers here because I think it's interesting to see what composers he uh, drew upon. Uh, you can see that he, obviously he would know Corelli being from Italy, but look, he has two of the important uh, French composers there of the Baroque times. He has two of the box. And of course, being in England, he would know Handel well. He also has Scarlatti um, and some of the more uh, current um, composers of the day represented. Um, he, of course, uh, was aware of the production of Beethoven and um, made a particular effort to meet him personally. And he did that on several of his subsequent trips to uh, Europe. And he worked out an agreement with Beethoven to actually publish Beethoven's works uh, in England. And for some of them, like the uh, Les Adieux Sonata, for instance, um, uh, Clementi was able to come out through his company with the first edition of the Les Adieux Sonata, among other things. And Beethoven had a very, very high opinion of uh, Clementi. And the more that I have been able to explore the works of Clementi, the more I realize how much Beethoven has taken from Clementi. Um, it is quite incredible. Um, here, I give you the quote that uh, Beethoven uh, apparently told Schindler about his opinion of Clementi's sonatas. He admired them for their lovely phrasing, original melodies, and the structure of each movement. And there's a, one of the early biographies of uh, biographers of Beethoven said that Beethoven always had a volume of Clementi sonatas on his piano, along with some Haydn, but no Mozart. So moving on in Clementi's life, he was now a businessman and he was, um, of course, uh, publishing music, building pianos, barrel organs, violins, woodwinds, and of course, composing. One of the um, things that Clementi did was he was one of the main founders of the Philharmonic Society of London in 1813. And that, of course, still exists today as the Royal Philharmonic Society. His importance was being recognized well uh, in other parts of Europe, as you can see with his uh, appointment to the Royal Swedish Academy of Music in 1813. What was Clementi's real purpose with the company? Well, of course, he didn't do the daily management. That was left up mainly to Collard, but because Clementi had all of these connections now on the continent and, and with other uh, piano making companies, he knew what they were doing. And so he often influenced what the de technical developments and the innovations were in the playing, in the production of pianos uh, of the Clementi company. He made some subsequent tours to uh, Europe in 1816. Uh, another important publication that a lot of people know about is his Gratis Ad Parnassum, which is a collection of studies, Steps to Parnassus that the first sets came out in 1817. And then he was off to Europe again to mainly do conducting um, in various cities uh, because by this time he had composed 20 symphonies. 
And uh, in 1824, a number of those symphonies were featured in programs of the Concerts of Ancient of Modern Music in London, England. He brought out the third set of his studies in various centers in 1826. And in 1827, two of his students, former students, Kramer and Machales, organized a banquet in his honor in London. And according to Marshall's diary, Clementi at that time improvised in a theme by Handel at the piano. Uh, he made his last public appearance at the opening concert of the Philharmonic Society in 1828, and then moved to a lovely estate um, near Lickfield, uh, Staffordshire. The family later moved to Eastham, where he died on 10th of March, 1832. And uh, with the last time that I was in London, England, I made a point of uh, finding out where, exactly where he was buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, and uh, so uh, on his burial on uh, 29th of March, three of his students, Kramer Field and Marshallis, accompanied his coffin. And of course, um, his, his uh, influence continued to a large extent. Um, largely through his sonatinas and um, his gratis ad pranasm. Um, and I think maybe that was why he has become denigrated to a certain degree because it, those were looked at as technical things. And a lot of his sonatas sort of fell out of use. And only now are we starting to get um, performances done of his symphonies. And we're, we're starting to realize what a great composer he was. So at the end here, I listed his children because I thought you would be interested to know that one of his uh, children ended up in Canada. And if you go on, online, you can find paintings done by his son, Vincent, who was also um, a, a rector in the uh, Anglican church and served in various churches in Canada. So that's just a brief overview of uh, Clementi the person. Now, let's turn to the instrument itself, the piano. <clears throat> and uh, I imagine that many of you know the uh, after the uh, invention from Cristofori, uh, as I mentioned earlier, German makers who had been involved in making clavichords uh, read the essay um, that described what Cristofori had created uh, with his er early pianoforte, and they started to experiment. And so there were a lot of German keyboard makers that had made various improvements. And one of them, uh, of course, was um, J.A. Stein in 1770, who uh, perfected the Prell mechanism, which was very important in allowing the rapid repetition of the keys and the hammers. And he added an escapement device. And that became known as the Viennese action. So in England, where a lot of German makers had uh, come in, particularly in the 1760s, because there was a very a major economic decline in the area that we now know as Germany. So a lot of them came to England because England was prosperous at that time. And so they continued to uh, develop uh, the instrument. And one of the main companies, of course, was John Broadwood. And I gave you the dates here of 1783 when he invented the damper pedal action. And uh, by 1793, he had the unicorda pedal. And he also produced the first piano with a range of over five octaves, because five octaves had been mainly the standard for harpsichords. And he did that in 1790. So I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of the technical things because we really need a, a piano tuner, a piano maker here to do that. But I'm trying to give you a little bit of an idea because the Viennese action is often referred to as a caress or brushing of the string. Whereas the English hammerheads will come up and they will strike on the string uh, directly. Um, the other thing that was different at this in, in this period in the early 1800s between the Viennese and the English pianos was the fact that the Viennese stuck with own, uh, up to two strings per key for some of the keys, whereas the English started to put three strings uh, per a pitch. 
on certain in certain areas. And so that made more sonority, of course. And the English also put in an extra lever, which made the action work better. Now, um, if hopefully you can see the cartouche on this instrument. It says new patent, Muzio Clementi and Company, number 26, Cheapside, London. Um, so that new patent came out in 1798, and it was for a five and a half or six octave double action piano. So here is your F, which was the standard low note that you would have on harpsichords. But this one also goes up to C. So above that, the five and a half, five and a half octaves is what we have here. And you can see this, this type of instrument um, was uh, the most important type of instrument produced in the first decade of the 1800s. Um, the estimate is that there were 400 square pianos produced annually, uh, up to a peak of 800 in 1810. And um, they also, of course, started to make wing pianos. Um, and that expanded to 1200 in 1810. Now, because the company was so busy making pianos, they had to have more space. So they continued to have the number 26 Cheapside location, but they also had a 195 Tottenham Road. Uh, a very disastrous fire took place there in 1807, but because they were in such financial good standing at this time, they were able to replace those facilities very quickly. Now here, I give you a quotation from the very well-respected German publication, the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, uh, that states in 1802, Clementi and company produced without question the finest, but also to be sure the most expensive instruments in the world, whose quality has been enhanced by Clementi's mechanical ability and artistic experience. So apparently, Clementi wanted to have a very light, transparent action on his uh, instrument. So a lot of the uh, inventions that they came up was to make this more feasible. And also, William Collard, who was one of their major technicians, had produced a harmonic swell um, that uh, allowed more sympathetic sounds uh, to the main uh, pitch. Uh, which is sort of like uh, a little bit like a damper pedal effect. Um, and then by 1810, they were producing six octave instruments. And of course, their greatest rival was Broadway. But uh, the Clementi pianos were uh, by far the uh, exported more widely, and particularly in the United States. Uh, and then one of the other things that they started to introduce, um, because of course this instrument, everything on it is wooden except for the pins that hold the strings and of course the metal strings themselves. Everything else is wood of the, about the frame. Um, and as they increased the um, range of the instrument, that put of course a lot more pressure on the case itself. And we have wonderful descriptions of pianists playing concerts and all of a sudden the piano just went to, to bits and pieces because it couldn't stand the strain. Um, so what the Clementi uh, company started to do was by 1812, they started to put in uh, metal reinforcements, including an iron hitch pin block. And uh, you can see from that time, they started to get up to six and a third octaves. So, uh, they needed that uh, metal reinforcement so they wouldn't fall apart. Um, their sales catalog of 1816 says about their grand pianos the following. These instruments are now brought to the highest perfection. The tones are full, rich, and brilliant. The touch is so complete that the most fastidious finger has nothing more to desire, and the movements are so constructed is to be entirely free from noise and unaffected by change of weather. So uh, in my research, uh, I came across uh, one article that sort of roughly gives them an idea about 
how much these instruments cost. Uh, and so I've given you the amounts in sort of modern day currency. So when this is in 1821, you would have paid $9,776 plus a few cents for a Clementi cabinet piano. But that's a cabinet one. You could get a Broadwood mahogany grand piano for only $5,659.99. So, you know, the comment about Clementi's pianos being so expensive, I guess, remained true for a long time. Um, after Clementi's death, um, the Clementi and Company uh, uh, remained as the name of the company for just a short bit. Uh, but then it was uh, became known as Collard and Collard because they were the main technicians. And uh, they um, and their descendants ran the company right through to 1921 when it was sold to the Chapel Piano Company. So many of you may be uh, curious about where did this instrument come from? Well, I had the privilege of uh, teaching at Queen's University um, and there was uh, one of the professors there was Denise Narcisse Mayer, and she had come from Jamaica. And she had this Clementi 40 piano, which she wanted to get rid of. And um, she was asking a, a very small sum for it. And I, because I had been doing a lot of research on early keyboard music, I, of course, was very interested in early piano 40s. So I bought it from her. And uh, it was entirely in its original condition at that point. And of course, needed a lot of work. Um, it took me some time to find a person who was willing to do this. Um, but I finally found a wonderful person here in uh, uh, Ottawa, Al Huapo, who had been um, restoring pianos, mainly from the midpoint of the 19th century, but was willing to take on this job. And he has worked faithfully on it for many years and um, has got it into working order. Um, and found out where he had to get strings and all of that sort of thing, and import what he needed um, from Europe. And uh, I, through the work that Leif Sahlquist has done, I've been able to date this as 1802. So uh, this was among the double action squares, the most um, prominent type of instrument uh, that Clementi and Company produced up to about uh, 1810. Uh, and then I've given you from his listing here uh, uh, these, what was so good about the Clementi Company was that they were very specific in their numbering system. Um, so that uh, the different types of instruments have their own series of numbers. And because he had personally looked at 300 of these pianos that exist in various parts of the world, he was able to work out the numbering system and find out what instruments it referred to. Um, now, because I have a number at the bottom here on the, on the case, uh, I was able to go to his listing and see and date this as 1802. I got in touch with him. He said, oh, it might be just at the end of 1801, but more likely 1802. And I sent him some pictures and he was fascinated with the pictures. He said, my goodness, he said, I haven't seen a Clementi 40 piano with such elaborate designs on it. So that started his thinking. This uh, piano 40 came from Jamaica. Where did our ish gentleman, Sir Beckford, where did he earn his money? They had plantations in Jamaica. And what we suspect is because it's so elaborately designed that this was a special order for one of their plantation houses probably in Jamaica. And they were thinking of it more as a piece of furniture than, than uh, a piano for to, to play. Um, and um, I did have my, um, my restorer, El Huatmo, add a damper pedal because there was not a damper pedal on it initially, but he said the action was such that a damper pedal could be uh, added. And I wanted that because um, later sonatas by Clementi very specifically give pedaling directions. And I wanted to explore uh, what those did uh, overall. So with that, 
I think it is time for us to actually listen to a sonata. And I, I decided to choose this, um, what I think is a wonderful, a beautiful sonata, the F-sharp minor one uh, from 1791. Uh, because I thought, well, that's probably a sonata that would be played on this instrument. And I'm not going to use pedal at all because there are no pedal markings in the score here. Um, and the other thing I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to just repeat the first repeats because in Clementi's treatise, he tells us that hardly anybody is doing the repeats anymore and particularly the second repeat uh, in, in a binary uh, structure. So um, I'll try to do just the first repeat. So here's the first movement, which he uh, has Allegro con Espressione. Thank you. 
second movement is Lento e Patetico. Thank you. 
thank you for your attention. Any questions? Wonderful, Elaine. That's really great. I'm sure you can hear the virtual applause. I know I can sense it. I'm sure people are clapping as they as they watch here live with us today. Um, there are a couple of questions coming up, and I'd encourage anyone that has any questions about the presentation that Elaine gave earlier or about the playing or about the instrument, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, Elaine, I have one thing here I just wanted that came to mind as you were playing, and that is the terminology around forte piano or piano forte. Are we using the terms interchangeably, or is this particular instrument part of one or the other? Um, I would say it's just interchangeable. I find that in the articles is sometimes one person will use one and the other, and they're actually referring to the same instrument. So I think either one is acceptable for okay. doing an instrument like this. Right. Okay. I had no idea. I always thought or was told that, you know, older, older or the first models of pianos were referred to as forte pianos because they had leather wrapped hammers. Is mm -hmm. that, is there any truth to that that you know of? Oh yes, the, the early instruments did have uh, leather wrapped. And um, in actual fact, in uh, redoing these, um, L had to um, figure out what type of skin would work because he had to make those because the old leather had disintegrated, of course. And um, what he, I think he, what he ended up finding was pig skin worked very well. Wow, okay, so this one is leather wrapped hammers yeah. here as well, I'm using pig skin. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Uh, a question from Ken. So by a transparent action, as specified by Clementi, does this mean a quiet or non-intrusive action? And so rather than looking into Google, he'd appreciate hearing your take on it. Could you expand a bit, a little bit on this? Um, yes, I, I think that what Clementi meant by that was that he wanted an action because he, he wanted to have a sustained melody line. And um, uh, what I hear about some of the earlier uh, forte pianos, I'm use that term, <clears throat> is that you actually still, it, it's just like playing a harpsichord. You sort of hear a little hiccup between each note. And I, th I think that's what Clementi wanted to get away with. He wanted to have this very, the possibility of a very sustained type of melody without the intrusion of the, um, any little mechanical noise happening between one note and the next. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, and then Elma's asking, what is the piano tuned to? Is it tuned to 440, A equals 440? Uh, yeah, we, we had big discussions about this um, for a while. Um, we knew it wasn't, of course, 440 <laughs> because they didn't use 440 at that time. Um, so for a while, we tuned it to 420. And the specific tuning that he decided to, to do of late is to use Verkmeister 3 with sort of like a 420A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, in Werkmeister, Werkmeister 3, I think the opinion is more or less settled now that that was most likely the tuning that Bach chose in the end. Mm -hmm. But right now you're tuned, you are tuned to 440 okay. now on this instrument. But, but with Werkmeister, Werkmeister. Okay. Highly Werkmeister. technical is tuning. There's a little, it's not, it's not the equal temperament per se, but it's the Werkmeister modifying, um, but having the A, that's 420. Right. Interesting. Okay. Carrie's asking, when was the name piano forte or forte piano dropped? And why do we settle with just piano? <laughs> and if, if you had your choice, what name would you give to our current instruments? Um, well, I suspect that uh, just like we got, we were saying that it sort of seemed to switch from 40 piano to piano 40. And I think that uh, probably with the larger uh, grand instruments that were being uh, produced um, in the uh, early 1800s, um, that people just started to refer to them as pianos. And we just dropped the 40. Mm -hmm. 
I think people just got lazy ever <laughs> say that big long name. <laughs> <laughs> Joe has a really interesting question here. It was, um, he found this very interesting, by the way. What are implications or what implications are there for our students who perform on pianos and keyboards? How universally acceptable and taught are these practices? Um, in trying to get closer to uh, an actual 40 piano effect, is that? Um, well, Joe? one of the things uh, that I would say, and I, I try pernickety with my own students, for instance, if they are working on the Clementi uh, sonatinas, um, I, for one, would have them use a very, very limited amount of pedal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing I think that is very important because Clementi is so specific about his articulation markings, uh, phrasings, and he loves the term Rinford Sandal. And you know, I find even among what I would consider well-trained musicians, uh, they they don't know the meaning of Rinford Sandal. They they equate it with Swartzado, but that is not the case. Um, and I I've come across some uh, early music dictionaries of the early 20th century where they give the wrong meaning for Rinford Sandal. Rinford Sandal means that you extend the special accent. <laughs> two to three times is not just one. And Clementi loves to use Rinford sandals. It seems to me you can use a lot more weight on this instrument to get an accent and it never really offends. That's the right. Ear. It doesn't get harsh. That's right. It sings. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Joe, if you need follow up to that, feel free to raise your hand in the app and we can bring you on to ask orally because I know you probably have other follow-up thoughts with that or feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, in terms of pedal, does, does Clementi ever indicate pedal in his scores at all that you can see? Oh, oh yes, in his later sonatas. And he's very specific about where he wants the pedal used. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I asked to have the pedal uh, 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 act, <laughs> attached to this instrument because I wanted to explore uh, what the effects were that uh, I know that it isn't the same as playing on a wing piano, for instance, but I thought it would still give me some idea of what Clementi was aiming for with his pedal markings. Mm -hmm. well, and I then, have to do much more exploration in that, but um, that's one of the things I'm looking forward to doing. And then for everyone's benefit, what is a wing piano? Well, the wing piano is, is the shape of, of our uh, modern grants. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, with that little summary that I put on the, um, the evolution of the piano, um, I actually, I don't know what, how many, you, you can usually go on, on the internet and see um, pictures of them, but I included um, the term giraffe pe uh, pianos because um, Solquist doesn't, doesn't refer to them like that in his article. But um, that, was, that was really what the upright series was. The, the upright series was, it was just like a grand piano, but it would only go back and then they had all the strings. It just went up to the, more or less, more or less to the ceiling. Uh, so it's like the back end, like the back end of a regular grand piano being tipped up this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sort of get, it was uh, a way of, of um, saving space, of course. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they were built so that um, the, the, the um, you know, you'd have it going up this and down this way. And sometimes they would square it off so that you could use this side as a bookcase or, uh, you know, whatever else you wanted to, <laughs> to store there. <laughs> Some interesting designs. Yeah. Did other composers pick up on Clemente's innovations, Clemente's innovations, and use it in their own music? This is a question from Elma. Oh, oh yes, I well, I Chopin, obviously, and Beethoven. Um, it, it, the, one of the things that I I want to go through much more systematically is just to try to find where I feel that Beethoven has just list, lifted things from Clemente, mm -hmm. um, and. We know that Chopin uh, was very fond of Clementi and used it with his students. So 
um, and you know the passage work um, that we find in um, the music of uh, well Mendelssohn, all, all those early romantics. It, it, I mean, it came out of the pianistic figurations that Clementi was inventing and using. Right. Here's a follow-up from Joe. Based on the comment of specificity of articulation and pedal, which edition do you use or recommend as being honoring of Clementi's intentions? Well, um, I, I've been uh, using, I find that, um, and the thing is, they, it, it's not that specific, but I, I have found that the, the best edition, it seems to reproduce um, a lot of, of what the Clementi Company first came up with. And that's the uh, Belwin Mills um, edition of, uh, they haven't got the complete sonatas, but they have, a, uh, they have four volumes of them. So they're a good number. Um, and uh, you know, even with the, um, the Opus 36 sonatinas, those went through five different editions. And, and it is interesting to, to see how, Clementi changed them because part of the changes that he makes in the later editions, of course, is the greater compass, uh, compass of the instrument of, so that he starts to add in more notes at the top and at the end, at the bottom, in those versions of the sonatinas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that uh, in some ways, there are some more specific articulations in the fourth and fifth editions of the sonatinas. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then we have a question here from Carrie. As I understand it, Clementi was inspired to discover so many technical innovations in playing because he had these wonderful new instruments to play with. Has there been someone who has made technical leaps since, or do you still apply Clementi's advances in your own music beyond his compositions? Um... Well, I, I think the one the the one that leaps to mind for me is Liszt, mm -hmm. um, and to a certain extent Chopin, because um, of course in France we have the wonderful renovations of the playo piano, and Chopin very much built on that, because Liszt was doing so much touring. Um, he of course was was using instruments of various makes, uh, and I. This is one of the things that um, I uh, am not aware of. I don't think he wrote specifically about his views of of various um, pianos being made at that time, but <clears throat> my feeling would be that um, because he found instruments that could do certain of the technical things that he wanted to do, he started to add that to his compositions. And of course, you, you know from, from his etudes too, they went through several versions so you can, can see how his thinking evolved about figurations that a pianist could do. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for getting the double thirds in Clementi's passage work? I notice you, yours are so nice and tight and, uh, and yet free. Uh, you know, at the, at the back of his, um, of his uh, art, before the, the pieces that he includes, the praise and so on, he does have various exercises. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they're, they're very practical. Uh, let me see whether I can find um, one or two here that he, he uses. Um, so, well, first of all, he has, he has scales in thirds. He has those kinds of things. Um, he does, um, uh, six like this. Um, and, um, in the thirds, he also does staccato. He even does, um, he does the thirds with changing the fingering, like this. So 
you get, uh, you know, if, in passage work where you want a very legato touch, you can practice that. Mm -hmm. um, what other interesting things does he do? Yeah, uh, in uh, six, he gives passages like this. <laughs> to fists and so on and so forth um so I, I you know i think he gives those uh to give agility in being able to do them one of these other thirds is like this very interesting well wow. they sound just so clean on this instrument too That's, yes and um you know i I feel that you know there's so much been so much concentration on his gratis ad parnassum as sort of exercises in their own right. But uh, I find I found when I went back and looked at these exercises that he actually has in his treatise, um, I found that they were much more helpful actually than than a lot that than just learning the studies in the gratis ad parnassum. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to finger independence. It looks like. Yes, um, I, I feel that, uh, and this is the thing that um, I try to stress a lot in my own teaching is the, you know, try to get a five finger position to get the most comfortable fingering, because that seems to, to me, that seems to be one of his basic principles in mm -hmm. how he does his fingering. And uh, this is why I like to have an edition that has uh, a lot of his own fingering in because uh, for instance, it gives us very good ideas about how he wanted ornaments for me. Mm -hmm. And um, as I will probably be bringing up in a couple of weeks, um, you can find, and, and it's also confirmed to a certain extent in his treatise, that he was doing lots of his trills starting on the principal note. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so Joe has put up his hand here. So Joe, just take yourself off of mute. And if you have a question, go ahead and you can be live here right now with us. Let's see if Joe is able to come on and ask his question, unless he raised his hand by mistake. I know that happens sometimes. Joe, you have the floor there. If you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Okay. So my, my question to you, Dr. Keller, is um, as, you, as you teach um, articulation and, and specifically the, the staccato, legato, and portato to students with, with, um, with the forte piano in mind, do you alter the, the technique to play it from what you would do, say, for Beethoven later sonatas, for romantic music, and for Baroque music? Or is it basically the same? Um, I would say it's basically the same. Uh, in Clemetti's uh, treatise, he makes a big point of the fact that our regular staccato, you know, mainly coming from the wrist, uh, we also have the, the slower staccato coming from the elbow, and then we, in very fast passages, we may have that little finger staccato just detach. And he's, he specifically talks about that. And I basically use the same approach if I'm playing on my modern piano. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for the question. Okay. And then we have another question here from Elma. Did the Clementi company spend as much time and effort on developing other instruments? I'm thinking of the clarinet, still a relatively new instrument then. Um, Unfortunately, I think because the, the records of the company were lost in the fire, we have, uh, unless somebody, I mean, there has to be somebody like Solquist come along and maybe look at all the clarinets that maybe were produced by the Clementi Company to have any idea of what they might have um, uh, developed. Uh, you know, I'm curious about barrel organs, for instance. Um, because, I mean, here in Canada, we do have a few extant barrel organs. Did they come from the Clementi Company? I don't know. It's an interesting thought, yeah. Anybody else have any questions here? I know we're running a little low on time here now, and, and 
Dr. Elaine's given us a lot of time here today and really excited us and letting us geek out here on, on Muzio Clementi. I'm sure we've all learned a lot more than we thought we could today. Um, and just addicted to the sound of your instrument. It's just an absolute pleasure to step into your space there and, and, and get to hear this music and, and have you make it come to life for us. And I'm sure we'll all approach those Opus 36 sonatas or sonatinas with our students and, and other works by Clementi with, with fresh eyes now. Such a vibrant, vibrant sound that we can get from, from this older instrument that we can have in our minds or inform in our imaginations as we're playing our modern pianos. So I don't see any other questions at the moment. Thanks everyone for joining. And uh, I hope you'll join us in two weeks time again when Dr. Elaine's gonna talk to us about ornamentation. And Elaine, do you have anything to say about that ornamentation just to pique our curiosity in advance? <laughs> well, it's just something that um, I have often been perturbed by, by results that I've seen given uh, for ornaments and, and particularly, you know, investigating the Clementi, it's come more and more to the fore. So I thought, um, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at all of the treatises, but I am going to throw some out, ideas out there and thoughts that I have about how to perform ornaments in this, in those, the period specifically from 1650 to about uh, 1826. Okay, fabulous. It's really great to, it'll be great to get this kind of um, advice and insight from a, from a seasoned performer such as yourself. And we appreciate your time today. And we look forward to that session in two weeks. In the meantime, everyone, you can catch the replay for this if you want to see it again. It's on the YouTube CCTV channel, uh, Conservatory Canada TV. Check us out there every Friday. Thanks for registering for this event and for your questions. And hope everyone has a great weekend. And we'll see you next Friday. Bye for now. <laughs>